our, a couple of comments on our survey sample, which, as Julie said before, is based on a, a list of top 50 corporates and philanthropists published in the Australian Financial Review. Um, I'm not sure how people in this room do surveys or not. In fact, when you ask most people if they do the survey, most people say no. Uh, so if you look at a sample size and you say around a third of people uh, completed the survey, that's actually a fairly robust view. Now, we talk about these two groups being large corporates and philanthropic donors as being uh, what you call a finite audience, I meaning there's not a, lot, not a lot of them. Um, and if I actually were to say to one of our corporate clients for whom we do business to business research, we've just captured 32% of the top 50 companies in Australia, they'd be deliriously happy. So whilst we look at that and say, I would like to see the number 50 up there for both corporates and philanthropic, philanthropic donors, we don't have that. But that's something that we're working on and which uh, Julie and Joyce and the people in her team, we work very closely on that. But I'd like to think if we come back and do this again next year, we get that over 20 and every year improve that incrementally. On the other hand, it's still a good sample base um, and it gives us a lot of uh, validity to the results and they're quite robust in our interpretation of the data. So the first point that I'll, I'll make is that uh, really the journey we were on is what we would call about conversion. And that means what we're trying to do is to make people ensure that the audience for the message of Australian investing women is uh, universally known, and then we need to help people understand why it's important. Uh, once they understand that, we need to help them activate that message and do something about it. Um, and from there, we need them to get them to spread the word and make it stick. So they're the key points that I'm going to go through over the next five to six minutes. And it does start with this chart. So this is at the top of that funnel, if you think about it that way. It's about awareness. Now, I must confess, when I would go back to that coffee back in 2016, I didn't know what gender-wise investing was, and I certainly had never heard of gender-balanced or gender-lens as terms. But uh, obviously, they connected fairly quickly. Uh, I'm pleased to say that seven years later, if we split our sample between corporate and philanthropy, 100% of the people in the survey sample were aware of at least one of those terms. And that's quite an accomplishment, because what it means is that it's a foundation for everything that follows in that conversion to get people to understand the message and for corporations to be equipped to do something with it. Behaviour is also changing. So that statement at the top is, uh, do you apply a gender lens to your community investments and giving? And you can see the number in the blue on the right-hand side is philanthropists, so 40% say they do, and 31% on the left-hand side say they, they do as well in terms of corporates. So if we went back, again, seven years, I, we didn't track that number from the start of the program, but um, I don't think it would be anywhere near that. Uh, we still want it to be higher, but to think that we stand now uh, on the sort of threshold of getting more than a third in the case of corporates and almost a half in the sense of philanthropists on board, that's um, quite an achievement. And if we look forward uh, even more, there's, there's more good news on the horizon. So what this chart shows is uh, the same number on the, on the previous slide, where we've got the 31% and 40% for both the audiences. The little sliver here, that's the proportion of organisations that indicate they're going to be implementing a gender-wise um, approach or gender lens on their community investment giving in the next uh, 12 months. Even more exciting, if you look the one underneath it, you've got 19% and 20% respectively who say they're under consideration. So that's the immediate audience that we need to focus on to make the maximum difference in terms of getting what I would think, if you draw a line halfway down the page, the total number over 50%. Now, my, my theory is, and it's something that I think it will probably be proven right, is that once you get to a certain threshold, it starts to take off. You get traction. People hear other organisations are doing the same thing and it moves from being something where people are forward leading to people feel like they better get on board because if they're not doing it, they feel like the ones who are left out, not the other way around. So uh, I think we're closing in on the point where we're going to get traction and where organisations, uh, both philanthropists and corporates, are going to feel like if they're not doing this, they're part of the exception, not the rule. So what do we need to do to make that happen? So it's not just the words, it's also actions. And I think this really sums it up as a statement, which is an individual is conscious of the impact of gender. The challenge is translating this into organisational thinking. So if we go back to that statistic on several slides back, we've got universal awareness now, and that's great. But as we all know, working in corporate, in large organisations and with large organisations, intent doesn't necessarily translate into action, and that's what we've got to focus on. The first one being we have to drive change from the top. 
And this is something, again, we've learned from all the programs we run in corporates around Australia and overseas, that leaders within organisations, when they believe in a message, uh, people do it. Um, so it has to be led by the leaders in an organisation. At the moment, 50% of our sample indicated they agree uh, with the statement, leaders within the organisation advocate, advocate for gender-wise approach. So there's work to be done there. And the point is that you can't ask others to do what you don't do yourself. Uh, so leaving this room today, I would encourage everybody to spread the word and, again, make others in leadership positions in this country understand what we're trying to do. The next one is around organisational capability. Um, the question we asked here was, or we asked respondents to agree or disagree to, is we have systems and processes that support us in taking a gender-wise approach. Now, this number is lower than the previous one, so just about a third of respondents said that that was the case. Now, why is that important? It's important because if we rely on goodwill, then it's not going to stick. So even if those changes are made and we get to the point of having organisations taking action and using gender-wise investing principles, then we might come back in four or five years and when those people move on, uh, we'll lose that traction in market. So we also have to have a foundation of policy. So uh, the statement we asked here was, organisation has a state of commitment to gender equity when making decisions about community investments and giving programs. So about 43% invested in that statement. And the reason that's important is that we have to engage hearts as well as minds. So if people believe in what we're trying to do and it's not just being told what to do or they feel that it's something the organisation just uh, becomes ticking boxes, as important as that might be, uh, it's something that they will again pass on to others and it will get its own life um, and start to self-propagate through organisations. Julie mentioned this before and I can't emphasise uh, this um, enough and probably at risk of being self-referential with presenting the survey data, but really what it comes down to is the concept of measurability and acquittal and helping organisations understand why gender-wise investing matters because it has a disproportionate impact in terms of the outcomes of giving. It's that simple. So when we read that statement, we support our recipients to report on the use of the funds when receiving respect to gender. It's of concern that only 30% say that they're able to do that. And we all know, and there's different ways that we can phrase this, but what gets measured gets done. So if we can help organisations be able to measure the impact of gender-wise investing, then we'll be able to make them feel that their message being heard and that we're seeing actions. So last but not least, to all those organisations that did take part, uh, we have something to give you, which is a benchmark against your key results against those who also gave feedback uh, through our research. And for me, this is super important because, again, it's about being able to say, how do we compare to the guys down the road or the people down the road? How is our organisation shaping up on those criteria such that looking ahead in 12 months, that gives you the basis for action to be able to define something you can look back and say, well, we changed that, we measured it, and now we can see the results of that in every aspect of what we do within this organisation. So um, last thing I'll say is thank you to Julie and everybody at Australian Investing Women. It's been a pleasure to be on the journey and I look forward to uh, more positive news in the years ahead and I uh, appreciate everybody's time today.